Andrea Todd, Director of uh, Culinary Business Development for um, uh, Dessert Holdings. She'll talk more about all the different, you know, uh, companies that they have <laughs> and continue to acquire. Um, and uh, Rachel Maddox, who's a Senior Director of Business Development uh, for Dessert Holdings, um, will be with us. And then, like I said, Dave Woolley. Dave's a Director of Culinary Innovation for Buffalo Wild Wings. And Quinn Atkins is Director of Menu Development for Culver's Franchising Systems. They'll be on a little bit later. Um, the agenda we're going to start with is Rachel will come on and talk a little bit about, there's a brand new study, and she'll explain more about what this is, a uh, brand new study that, that came out from Data Central uh, last week, right? So it's really new. Yeah. So anxious to see, you know, what came out of that and things that have changed here in the last year uh, or even more, but most importantly, recently. And that's one of the things I love about working with them is because they're, you know, their research is, you know, is, is the best in, in my opinion. So anyway, we'll talk about that. Then Andrea is going to come on and talk about uh, a little more about some of the like, uh, you know, street desserts, get a little more in depth into what's happening in flavors and seasonal flavors and especially cheesecakes. So that's it. And then we'll have the other uh, board members come on to really talk about what's happening in their world and desserts and where we're going. Uh, so for those of you who have known us for a little while, we started out um, with three companies is probably the last you heard. Uh, the original Cakery, Lawler's, and Atlanta Cheesecake Company. And, uh, you know, the original Cakery uh, really known for uh, their layered cake ability, as well as dessert bars and brownies. And uh, then from that point in time, we added on uh, Lawler's Desserts. And Lawler's is like such a historical food service company, uh, really amazing uh, cheesecakes, really tall, beautiful, grab attention through the dining room, um, as well as round cakes. Um, and then Atlanta Cheesecake Company, which came on in 2018, was, was more of a retail-focused addition to the dessert holdings portfolio. And uh, so since we probably saw you guys last, uh, we also added Steve and Charles to our portfolio. And so they're based uh, in Denver as well as North Carolina. Um, and they, you may know them uh, historically as SRO or Stephen Roberts Original. Um, so uh, they joined us in uh, like the close of 2021 uh, and then fully integrated into our team in about October this last year. So uh, their uh, capabilities are really amazing in terms of more individual uh, items such as cookies or uh, cake bites, lava cakes, things like that. Um, and then lastly, uh, around Halloween last year, we added Diane's to our portfolio. And so Diane's uh, is just super complimentary to uh, the rest of the food service portfolio and uh, has a lot of uh, adjacent uh, capability in things like cheesecake and cakes uh, that kind of just help build out our portfolio as kind of this one-stop dessert shop. So um, we just continue to grow, um, uh, and you know who knows what will happen by the time we see you guys in June. So, uh, something uh, that we are very proud of is just our desserts are made uh, with real ingredients. Um, uh, we uh, kind of our baseline stock portfolio of products are always uh, clean label, uh, no high fructose corn syrup, no artificial colors or flavors. Aside from red velvet is always that asterisk there as we still can't seem to find a natural red that really delivers. But, um, you know, real cream cheese, all of those things that uh, seem like a given, but maybe ne aren't necessarily the truth uh, when you are looking at product. So very proud of our portfolio ingredients. And then, uh, of course, you have Rachel and myself on the call today, um, and we always joke that isn't it fun to talk about a slide with your face on it? Um, uh, but uh, it's it, we're really here as your team, um, and we have you know myself from a, a on the street trends, um, and then helping you decide you know what should be on your menu, um, and building that out with you. Uh, and Rachel has all of the data that backs that up. So, uh, you know, NPD, uh, as well as Data Central and Technomic, 
uh, we can pull all sorts of information that can help you make a really educated uh, decision on what goes on to your dessert menu and what your competitors are doing. So this is just a top line quick uh, of you know what we have in the portfolio it kind of gives you a little bit of a, a visual to some of those call outs I made earlier. Um, and uh, of course this this is just a top line. Uh, we do lots of custom stuff as well. So um, always, you know, always growing in this slide uh, from a capabilities standpoint. All right, so now that there's a little baseline of uh, who we are as of today, I'll pass it over to Rachel for some insights on desserts. Great, awesome. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about what I wanted to uh, sort of talk about today, I always think it's important to ground us in how is the industry performing. And uh, this just is taking a four year view of what's been happening to us in food service um, as a whole. Um, and you can see that this is year ending December 2022, and that traffic overall was flat, right? Um, and then you can see from your check average and your dollars, we saw an increase there, which is really driven by inflation. And, you know, if your chains or restaurants increased price um, and then but just sort of felt like you didn't gain any more traffic or perhaps traffic uh, remained about the same as it did the year before. That's pretty consistent um, with what the overall industry experienced. And if you can click ahead, Andrew, I've got a little build in here. Um, one watch out I would say, you know, that that is keeping me up at night and I think about is, you know, how is inflation really impacting consumers behavior? And if you think about you personally, how often you're going out to eat these days versus, you know, maybe where you were in, you know, 2019, early days of 2020. Um, and we're seeing that there are consumers who said, you know, that they are watching their budget and they aren't visiting a restaurant. Um, that reason's up to 17%, that's up 5% versus where it was a year ago. So it's definitely becoming more important. I know it's more important in my life with my kids um, and we're definitely seeing that crossover. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what 2023 has in hold, hopefully some recovery. Um, but you can see this, um, so this is essentially just tracking the industry volume like with, uh, from a traffic perspective and that big black, I in intentionally made it black. That was the year of COVID. Um, and you can see that we still haven't recovered from a traffic standpoint. Um, and so we do have some opportunity to get consumers back out and spending and having more occasions out at restaurants. So that was like what happened in the total, you know, the total industry. But then when we looked at dessert holding or dessert servings, we're seeing uh, a very similar message. So um, uh, in desserts, you know, obviously that black bar, so that's the, the year of COVID. But what we saw in 2021, it actually declined even further from that um, with the bounce back up in this past year. So there's definitely still opportunity for us to grow in dessert servings and really making um, it more prevalent on menus and giving consumers that opportunity to order dessert. Um, because there's definitely still some white space opportunity and, and opportunity to gain share from where it was just um, a few years ago. Something that was interesting, um, so this data is from NPD Crest, and I pulled out, you know, I wanted to see, um, you know, who's winning, what, what dessert category wins in QSR and full service restaurants. And what wasn't very, it wasn't uh, surprising to that uh, cookies was a top performer in quick service restaurants, um, followed by brownies. So those were your, no, your number one and number two. I'll say that this um, data does not include frozen ice cream. So Quinn out there is probably like, what about my ice cream? It's not included in, uh, in this view of your dessert categories. Um, what was really interesting, I'll call your attention to was servings of um, cake and cheesecake. So when I pulled this data in November, 2022, cheesecake was number one, the most deserved, uh, the most dessert served in uh, 2022. And then just a month later, cake really outperformed and did a good job of catching up. And so now it's, it's holding on to that number one 
ba- that number one spot, but it's definitely important to think about like, okay, there's definitely this, like, you know, um, those two are really important to full service restaurants, this cake and cheesecake, um, and then followed by brownies and cookies. And then um, I, you know, cause we were talking a lot and you'll see this in the dessert uh, keynote, but we're seeing a lot of um, information around seasonality of desserts. And so, you know, I had this hypothesis going into this um, NPD data that um, all the desserts over index in the holiday months, right? Like that's when we eat all of our desserts and that's when the most servings occur. Well, um, I was proven wrong by NPD. So if you look at quick service restaurants, what's interesting is that really the only the brownie is the dessert that has the most servings um, in the fourth quarter. And similarly, when you think that we're all on our New Year's resolutions and we're not going to have desserts, um, in full service restaurants, cake, cheesecakes, and brownies had the most servings last year. They were the top performing uh, dessert categories in January, February, and March. So, um, you know, really, I think that we're always going to see fluctuations in servings um, depending on, you know, what's happening in the economy and maybe things were looking better in February and COVID was better last year. So there's lots of, um, you know, flexibility that happens with these consumers. But I think it's just important for us to sort of, you know, think beyond the fourth quarter desserts because there's certainly opportunities um, year round um, as we're seeing in this data. Okay, so this is pretty exciting, you guys. As Kevin mentioned, this data came out last Tuesday, I think, and it's it's like 200 slides. I've only picked out my what I think my favorite parts are and what I think um, you guys will appreciate. But if there's something else that you guys are sort of, you know, we can't obviously talk about 200 slides today, um, but it's definitely something that offers out there. Um, that if you want to dig into a specific category on cheesecake or, you know, cookies or what's how are consu- consumers motivation for dessert, that's all um, in here. And we're happy to um, help you solve some of your dessert uh, challenges. So for today, though, I really focused on that seasonal limited time offering because it's one of the top trends that Dead Essentials pointed out. And then there's also some really compelling consumer information. So you know, this was, uh, you know, when you look at 48% of consumers are looking forward to a seasonal limited time offer. I mean, I think I was really excited to see the Shamrock Shake come out. Um, but really, if you look at even digging further, those Gen Zs and millennials even are look forward to it even more. So 62% of Gen Zers are looking for those seasonal limited time offers. So that feeling of, you know, they sort of have that instant gratification. They've grown up on social media, right? So they're the ones that really are dialed in to what's happening, what's cool, what's seasonal. Um, So it wasn't surprising to me to see those Gen Zs really pop when it comes to wanting to have that must-have dessert that they can only get for, you know, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, and this slide talks about, you know, when the consumers are, when we ask and we think about why, you know, what are some of the factors? What are the reasons why when you go out to eat, um, you're going to order a dessert, right? You've had your meal. Um, what's what's the occasion? What's the driver? Um, and what's always good for us to see is that it really comes down to the flavor profile. Um, and that's even more important than affordability or cost. So that's something that we always like to see. Um, that's really driving that decision. I'll tell you that when you go, when the consumers are going into a grocery store, affordability and cost is number one. So that's something that we see that switch when it comes to a retail. Um, And then obviously variety and dessert. So one thing I'll say, we'll hear this a little bit further on uh, down the road in this presentation is that, you know, consumers really like what's comfortable for them when it comes to desserts. It's definitely um, a little bit of a different behavior than you would see for your center of the plate. So they're definitely into more of the nostalgia flavors, things that are comforting. If they're going to order it, they want to make sure that the calories are worth it and that it's going to taste good. 
Um, this was a new slide. I really loved the way they looked at essentials, looked at this question. So it's this idea of really trying to find what's the opportunity, what do consumers want and lining up against what operators operators are offering today and where's that gap that's happening. So um, you can see when it talks about consumer interest and it comes to desserts. So nostalgic is up there. So 57% of consumers are interested in nostalgic desserts, but only 43% of operators are offering. So it feels like that feels like something like there's definitely an opportunity and gap between what the restaurants are offering today and what consumers are interested in. Our operators have got it down with seasonal desserts. Um, they're see, in that case, they're offering it at a higher rate of consumer interest, but it's definitely between seasonal desserts and mini desserts. Those are your top three areas of interest for consumers. So I definitely would, you know, take a step back and take a look at your dessert menu and see if there's any opportunities there. Um, and this is, this tracks um, introduction of new desserts. So um, one thing that I thought was really great, you know, when we have been in a recession in the past, there was a limitation for how much innovation would happen. And, and our industry really dialed into the value play. And what's been really exciting about this go around between COVID and the inflation struggles, um, we really haven't seen this dip in uh, LTO and innovation. Instead, we've seen sort of at the same levels or increasing. Um, but the message here is again, sort of leaning into innovation can happen year round. It doesn't need to be just at the fourth quarter. Although you can see, um, you know, sort of that September time period is when you're really getting ready for all those pumpkin uh, desserts and spice cakes um, and indulgence desserts. But, um, you know, again, think about it uh, more openly and how you can, you know, really bring those nostalgic seasonal desserts year round to your customers. Great. And I think, I, I hope we can send this off as like a takeaway, but this is one of my favorite slides. Um, Data Essentials has been doing this. I think I get this from them every year, but they're tracking sort of the top flavors that happen in the different times of year. And so, you know, when you're a consumer and you're looking for those seasonal flavors, um, you know, pumpkin, cinnamon, those are all really those fall favorites. Um, but year round, this happens. So this is something that I love. I like. I keep these slides by my desk. Uh, so when you guys are asking me for some seasonal ideas or when we're building our pipeline of desserts to come, we really lean into sort of what are the top flavors that consumers look for specifically, because that could be the thing that, again, that top reason why they're going to order that dessert all relates back to that flavor profile. Okay, and I think we're turning it over to Andrea. Yep, and Kevin, just to double check, it looked like there was a Q and A and a chat. Do you want us to pause or? I think keep going. We'll ask that. You know, when okay. you get toward the end of the presentation, yeah. If okay, perfect. If that's cool I didn't open it up because I didn't know how to do it. I just saw no, it no, it's fine. So. It's fine. Yeah, we'll do that. I think we'll do that when you're done with your part of the presentation because hopefully everybody will stay on. I think they will. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, so to build on what Rachel kind of set up here from a seasonal LTO standpoint, um, we wanted to, you know, put some thought starters out there in terms of uh, some Q4. Obviously, as Rachel said, Q4 isn't necessarily the only place you can innovate uh, with LTOs, but uh, it is something that uh, could still hit the menu this year with the time of year that we have now. Um, so you know, thinking of, you know, how do you play in Halloween? Uh, you know, is there something that you really uh, partner with a candy brand um, and add inclusions or something to a cake? Or um, here we, we have like a cookies and cream layered bar uh, that kind of encapsulates the, the, the eating experience of an Oreo. Um, when it has, you know, the, the Oreo bits in the the bottom of the brownie as well as crushed up on top. Um, these could both be great uh, fun ways to launch some news around Halloween. Um, and then of course, Thanksgiving is always a big one, right? And we all know, you know, Starbucks launches pumpkin spice latte earlier and earlier every year. Um, 
but uh, pumpkin is still one of those favorite flavors. So though there's, uh, you know, we can go full pumpkin with a pumpkin cheesecake option. Um, there does seem to be a real cutoff in terms of uh, what consumers want past Thanksgiving. So uh, some ways to think about uh, Thanksgiving uh, LTOs when you use pumpkin, is it, you know, are you finding a sauce that incorporates pumpkin or some other element? Um, or are you using uh, like a praline sauce or something uh, with apples or poached pears, something like that to drive uh, a lot of that fall flavor profile? Um, and then your base product, whether it's uh, this classic New York cheesecake or this is a vanilla trust leches cake. Um, you know, that can be used then as the season continues on and you just change out your sauce. And then uh, kind of the same idea then for uh, as we roll into a uh, holiday and winter. So a lot of, uh, you know, these concepts I think could be utilized, whether it's uh, just for the Christmas uh, time holiday, or whether you roll this all the way from December through February and you uh, are able to hit uh, with Valentine's Day as well. Um, something like a, you know, a chocolate layer cake with uh, the candy cane element, uh, the black forest cake with like a beautiful cherry filling. Um, obviously red velvet cake is a consumer favorite and that great cream cheese icing in the middle. Um, or the chocolate uh, ganache cheesecake here and you add something like a dipped strawberry to really uh, amplify that. Um, things like this uh, idea where you have almost two desserts in one is really uh, something fun as well. It's almost like a little mini extra dessert, whether it's a dipped strawberry or if you did something like a s'more element with a, a toasted marshmallow on top. Uh, thinking in smaller portions, something like uh, a small three inch uh, cheesecake that can be done with different sauces, maybe served as a flight uh, or a pairing with uh, beverages as well. And then uh, something like a key lime pie that could be amplified for the fall uh, winter season with a cranberry sauce. And then, you know, in summertime, maybe adding something more like a mango or a strawberry sauce to that. So many of you have been on trend tours with us before, um, but it is something that uh, we love to do and uh, explore new cities and, you know, uh, eat tons. Um, it's something that we always do around NRA timeline uh, in Chicago, but uh, we went out to Las Vegas in the fall this year and, and looked at, we were at one hotel, uh, we were at the Venetian, and we were able to really dive into a ton of really cool uh, dessert ideas by just staying within one single hotel. So uh, the world is your oyster there in Vegas, obviously, but um we uh, wanted to share some of those trends that we saw with you uh, just for a little bit of inspiration. Yeah, so quickly, uh, Andrew's gonna dive right into these amazing desserts that we had the terrible job to taste. Um, but uh, I wanted to call out the uh, a few key takeaways that Dad Essentials um, had picked up in their trends and that definitely um, sort of aligns with what we were seeing um, on the streets. And so nostalgia, I mean, I feel like, I mean, we see nostalgia a lot. I've seen nostalgia probably um, year after year um, when working in, in the dessert category. And I think it really goes to the fact that, you know, consumers, they're, they're adventurous to a point um, and that nearly half of consumers would prefer something traditional. And I think that you know, what we try to do is take those, you know, traditional flavors that everyone, you know, is really familiar with. And then how do we introduce it into a new way that's exciting and different? So still bringing innovation, but we call it safe exploration, right? It has to be, we still want them to order it. And then again, just leading with 
the flavor. So this is just, it's going to be the reason whether or not a consumer is going to um, order that dessert or not. So just taking the time to, again, um, you know, every quarter, take a look at your menu, um, talk to your customers, who are you trying to attract and order uh, your desserts, um, and make sure that you're meeting the flavor profile that they're looking for. Great. So uh, a few of our favorites, uh, Beauty in Essex, if you haven't been, it's uh, hidden behind a pawn shop. Um, and so you walk up to the restaurant and uh, you think you're walking into this pawn shop. They have, you know, uh, jewelry and guitars and all sorts of stuff in there for sale. And then you walk back through this hidden door into the restaurant. Um, and then in the back, um, you know, we had, of course, lots of great savory food as well. And I wanted to also include, I thought these were super cute. They're like little uh, cheese dumplings. Uh, inside a spoon of tomato soup uh, as a new way to look at grilled cheese uh, and tomato soup. Uh, so I'm sure someone on the line here today will take that and run with it and make it more available for all of us. Um, and then we also looked at, uh, I just really loved the theater of this beauty wonder wheel. So inside the wonder wheel, are like little muffin cups filled with all sorts of little desserts, whether it's like Madeleines or chocolate truffles or uh, bite-sized donuts, things like that. And the, and the wheel spins um, and it's lit up and like talk about something that like comes through the dining room and really then everybody else wants to order it. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, donuts and dip I mean, there's nothing wrong with a warm donut served table side. From there, we went to uh, Chica. So uh, the colors, flavors, textures at Chica were like stand out. Um, you see the little uh, conchas uh, that have been done with colored sugar on top and like very unique ice cream flavors inside, like a strawberry habanero um ice cream in there uh the churro bouquet so um this we i mean talk again about something that comes through the dining room looking amazing and i as i was pulling this together i was like i really can't believe we paid 25 dollars for like a dozen churros um talk about uh being able to make some money on an item there the showstopper though at chica was this flaming uh chocolate skull so they brought this chocolate skull that was molded out to the table and then uh, lit it on fire. And then, of course, it dissolved and there was uh, cake and berries inside of it. And then down at the bottom here, they're spin on like an elote, but this was a sweet. It was filled with cheesecake uh, and then molded to look like corn and dusted on top uh, with uh, some different texture uh, chocolates and things to look like the Cotija cheese. So uh, I heard Rachel call out nostalgia, uh, something like the Nutella sundae or the, the full Elvis waffle at Sugar Cane. Um, these, again, uh, really hit on that uh, nostalgic flavor profiles, but also when you see the Nutella Sunday incorporating uh, popcorn as well as that brulee banana, um, it's just adding those fun elements of texture. And then donuts were definitely a theme. Um, and these donuts were filled with a key lime curd, which made them even more fun. Then we went on to Sushi Samba and uh, they had some really great uh, desserts. Again, uh, mashing up like warm and cold with the honey toast. Uh, it had that griddled effect on the bread um, and then a pour over table side for, for effect, um, as well as you know some tie to some coffee flavors, uh, unique plate ups, and then the chocolate banana cake with uh, this really amazing, you know, dried banana piece on the side. Uh, one of our favorites that we've been to in a few cities is Yardbird. Um, they're the chocolate 
cake uh, served with bourbon and bananas is, or bourbon and bacon, sorry, is uh, one of the favorites. Uh, it's this enormous piece of cake that comes out uh, table side enough to probably feed 12 people, but, uh, you know, finished then uh, with some candied bacon on top and it's just, uh, it's just a can't miss. They also have a strawberry peach cobbler that they bring out that has a sugared dome that they put on top and then they bring out a mallet and you go ahead and crack that open and then inside is this uh, strawberry and peach uh, bubbling cobbler. So some really fun uh, flavor profiles here. Everything, you know, bigger was better. Of course, uh, that cinnamon roll you see in that skillet at the bottom is bursting out of the seams there. And then uh, just some really gorgeous uh, plate designs as well, incorporating color, texture, um, as well as the flavors. So that's all we have today for uh, the street trends. Um, so I'll, I'll pause and pass it over to Kevin. Awesome. That was a great presentation. You know what, you're killing me. We are actually leaving on uh, Friday to go to Vegas and we're staying at the Venetian. So thank you so much for oh, those comments. You're... That'll come in handy. <laughs> that was the most fun expense report to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so if anybody on the call, like we only made it to one hotel in Vegas. That's so funny. It feels like we could, you know, hit up a couple more hotels. And That's funny. You only did one. That's really hilarious. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, you know, Dave and uh, and Quinn will be joining us here too. So we can start a little conversation with them as well. But yeah, th there was a couple of things on there I thought was quite interesting for me that kind of blew me away. Like the full service restaurants that in the fourth quarter cookies. Really? That was shocking to me. I know. I mean, that was that because I went into when I pulled that data, I went into it really expecting for the story to be you know, fourth quarter is where all the desserts shine. Yeah. Um, and to find out that, you know, there, there was a lot more uh, seasonality when it came to consumption patterns, right? So those are, that data is pulled from consumers' receipts of what they actually ordered. Um, and so, you know, I thought that was really fascinating. And then, it, I mean, it also, you know, taught me to think about uh, every season. So, um yeah, so it was definitely a learning for me as well. Yeah, that was that was really cool. And, you know, and, and I think that, you know, there was a couple other things on there that I thought was kind of interesting that, um, you know, first of all, I want to do uh, catch up with what you said, Rachel, so everybody knows. Definitely send this to me as soon as we're done with this, because uh, Mike will be putting the video together from this entire, you know, uh, webinar. And we'll add into that in our website, you know, the slides so everybody can see that. So we'll try to, we always try to get that done by the end of the week, by Friday, you know, at the, uh, at the latest. But uh, I was kind of interested too, when all the new dessert menus were coming on, because you could see that it's all happening in advance of the season coming up, right? So I think it was May for summer, right? And it was like January, you know, when you saw, you know, some of the bigger ones come out. So, and I think in the fall, it was a little earlier too, but it makes sense. I mean, get it on the menu, get people used to it and looking for it and looking forward to it, I guess. Right. And it's a lot of work, right? Like I know everybody here, it takes a, it's a lot of work to get the marketing. You know, if you're going to do a seasonal LTO, like do it right, get the, get the images and the great descriptions. And, um, and then of course, you know, getting it into your individual units, like it's, it's definitely um, something to plan for. Um, but it, but the consumers are telling us that they want it. And, um, and so worth uh, the return in servings and attachment. Yeah. And I loved your comment too to Quinn about, you know, that, that uh, frozen desserts were not in the research survey. <laughs> right, Quinn? Yeah. Come on, talk to us. <laughs> You're muted. No, I know. I, I pulled it uh, specifically based on, uh, I mean, you know, there's, we could have a three hour conversation about trends in uh, in frozen desserts. It's such a massive category beyond just, you know, uh, blizzards and shakes and ice creams like there's so much that you can do within that category um that i made it a bit more general but my daughter every day tells me what the flavor of the day is at culver's quinn so <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, Quinn, you want to talk to that a little bit? Because it is kind of interesting. I, I'll say this here, of course, living in Florida, might, you know, we might be a little um, swayed by certain things, but uh, there's some boutique ice cream stores here that are just taken off. And the more they build more locations, the longer the lines are at their original location. It's kind of crazy. You know, it's uh, Kelly's is one of them here and it's just blowing up. And uh, but it seems to be, I think, bigger than ever. And gelato is starting to hit here now, too, which we never really had much of in Florida. You saw a lot more of it in South Florida, Miami or whatever. But here you're starting to see a lot more of it in Central Florida. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. So th what I'm seeing in, in this category specifically as it applies to frozen frozen concepts is you are seeing a lot more inclusions and variegates that emulate these kind of classic classic baked desserts. And um, it, what's interesting to me is the quality of the inclusions can have a significant impact on whether you kind of emulate that that baked item as a cohesive whole. Uh, the challenge with using especially frozen custard as kind of your medium is all of those flavors have to punch through all of that fat, all of that sugar. And when you freeze most items, those flavor profiles tend to be muted. So you almost have to like over index the, the flavor profiles because of how the finished product is going to be used. And the other piece is, is that it can't be overly sweet. So because you already have a massive amount of sugar in the custard itself, so it can easily become a sugar bomb. So it, it's a little bit more challenging than just, you know, taking a slice of Black Forest cake and dumping it into and blending it into a concrete mixer because it's just it just hits you in the fillings. And there's a certain um, famous burger and hot dog chain out of Chicago that shall remain nameless that has a very, very famous shake on their menu that I just can't eat. It, it, it is so sickly sweet. Um, it's just not balanced. So I make sure that the things that I develop and it makes it a lot more challenging, right? So going back to the Black Forest example, yeah, we have a wild cherry topping, but it's already so sweet and we've got a chocolate cake and it's already so sweet. So yeah, it works, but it's not optimized. Um, I would like to see, you know, more of a, uh, a, a true wild cherry that doesn't have a whole lot of added sugar to it. And you just get that, that much better balance of acid, acid and sugar. Oh, that's cool. Hey, Wolves, let's bring you into the conversation. I know you're coming into a crazy time of the year for you guys with March Madness and other times of the sports year where you guys are going crazy. Do you change the menu for something like, like March Madness for desserts? I mean, we're saying specific for desserts, but, you know, you can talk about others, too. No, we don't. Not with desserts. With wing sauces, yes. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but what I wanted to say is I can say firsthand on uh, the craziness that happens when you're with Rachel and Andrea on a dessert diner round. Um, you almost could get diabetes just in that one day if you're not <laughs> careful. Totally. Proud of that too. I mean, yeah. I, mean I, I think it's just such a fun, um, there's so like Data Essentials and, and you know, NPD Crest, like there's such great platforms for us to be able to like capture like large scale trends. But in, you know, when you're on the street and you're going from donut place to donut place, as we did in uh, Chicago, to really see those trends come to life and executed. Um, that's really, I really find like that's the value of the culinary team and um, and Chef Andrea because um, those are things that you know you can't capture in a in a table, right? Um, so they're yeah. super valuable. It's funny you bring up the donut thing because we have absolutely, and you know, Quinn and and, and Wolves can definitely speak to this. I mean, every time we go to a place, you've got to check out the donuts in a certain area because they do, they are different, right? They're like, I don't, you know, understand exactly why, but they're mm -hmm. catering to local flavors or things that, you know, are maybe grown in the area or whatever it might be. But it's really kind of cool and interesting to see the diversity of donut shops throughout the country. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, I, I hope this, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, 
uh, because I know that we have worked on some packaging things over the years. Uh, nothing that's not necessarily, uh, you know, hit for us. But uh, can you guys talk a little bit about any of the innovation or future stuff that might be happening around packaging and desserts and to-go formats, things like that, because the, uh, you know, out of restaurant, uh, in restaurant is very important to us, obviously, um, but out of restaurant is just as important. And it's a discussion I know that uh, the three of us have had many times. And so I just, I just wanted to kind of bring that out and see if there's a discussion to have there. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that was one of the things that made us so excited about um, the acquisition of Stephen Charles um, is just their ability to to flow wrap uh, bars and brownies, uh, you know, iced sugar cookies, things like that. Um, and so I would fully, you know, uh, say that we're we're all over that in finding ways to make things more portable um, and an individual portion too. I mean, I think that continues to be a conversation, whether it's miniatures or uh, just more of the um, able to just feel less guilty about your portion size. Um, but having things that are individually wrapped or whatever, they also give you some of that um, shelf life that you might need as well for an item like that. And so uh, yeah, it's definitely something that we are working on, and it's part of my uh, work for this upcoming year is to come up with some core items that can be available, uh, like from a stock portfolio perspective, uh, available individually wrapped or ready for to go, um, as well as, you know, we, of course, do all sorts of custom stuff, but uh, that is, you, yeah, so hold me accountable. Uh <laughs> Oh, and I was just going to pop in. I think what's really challenging about, so absolutely, we've been investigating individually wrapped um, even before, you know, COVID hit and it became really important. Um, but it's, it is a real struggle because you have to balance things like you want something in order for it to go through a flow wrap, right? You have to design the bar differently. And it, sometimes it takes away some of the more premium elements things that like we really, you know, pride ourselves and we want those like big, like, you know, we're going to do a caramel brownie. Like we want it to be like really ooey gooey. We want to have it to look like so appealing. And then you try to put that thing through a flow wrapping machine. Right. And it's just like, you sort of have to really simplify, um, that experience. Um, you know, and then you want to have like really great clean ingredients. Um, and then you put something into a flow wrap with a, sh you know, a longer shelf life, right. There's, trade-offs that you have to make. Um, and I, so I think that's something that has been, um, like a real, a real struggle with individually packaging, I think for dessert holdings, it's something that like, where you have like this really, you know, we want to do like a butter cake individually wrapped and, um, you know, it's again, what can survive the flow wrap machine. So, uh, you know, just, uh, definitely something that we're always working on. We have, uh, a number of projects, uh, in the way of flow wrapping, uh, individual cake truffles. So that could be pretty interesting and fun, um, down the road. Uh, but definitely reach out if, you know, there's anything more that we can do. And we, like, we've probably been working on it. It's just, you know, making sure that it lives up to the premium quality, um, that we want to sell you. Yeah. I've got a question. It may be a little shift here, but you know, we're talking about dessert ingredients and trends and even, you know, seasonality. Um, let's talk about like, are there any new fruits? I mean, of course, the apple, the strawberry, the berries have always been. Is there any new fruit that's like breaking through that's like, oh, my God, I'm excited about? Um, I feel like, well, I did a presentation in the fall um, around uh, ume, a Japanese uh, plum. Uh, and so... I think that was like a little bit uh, far out for most, but um, I do feel like we're seeing more um, of like, just like the dragon fruit, um, uh, the butterfly pea flower kind of ingredient, those sort of like color pop is I think ube. Um, so not necessarily like specifically a fruit, but like those ingredients that really drive color and like that Instagram ability. Um, even just, uh, thought it was interesting. I was able to get like a few varieties of 
you know, dragon fruit powder, ube powder to work on, work on projects with, and they really do drive a lot of color. Um, so I think that those would be kind of my top things, but I don't know if, uh, Quinn, Quinn, you always seem to, to have all the, uh, top trending flavors as well. Is there anything else you can think of? So there's a difference between top trending flavors and there's a, and what is applicable at, at Culver's. Right. Because yeah, yeah. We, we have to kind of thread that needle and ensure that, you know, anything that we bring to the fore approaches, you know, almost universal appeal. Um, so from a new ingredient perspective, I, I do believe that some of the citrus flavors that you're talking about and kind of paired together in a familiar way, um, obviously, you know, calling something ume, you know, or um, yuzu are probably a little bit of a tough sell, but that doesn't mean we can't incorporate them into the flavors because that that then is a further differentiation, you know, you call it, you know, just uh, citrus grove or, you know, or something like that. Um, the, the interesting thing about utilizing citrus in a frozen, fresh made dessert is citric acid. Um, when you introduce it into a custard base, turns the custard into pudding. So we actually had to engineer a high flow valve for some of our um, our citrus based flavors a, a few years back and um, kind of balance that that pH so that uh, it'll actually run through the machines. But um, you know I, I do think that the 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 line drive up the middle that still really resonates with, core consumers across across the country is incorporating uh, familiar baked goods into frozen frozen concepts. Um, I'm in Tampa right now, and there's a uh, a concept called Bright that's directly adjacent to uh, to the hotel, and like 50 percent of the flavors that they have have some sort of baked good inclusion in them. Um, and and that's that, that's an interesting approach, right? So if it's fresh, the baked goods are fresh, then you know that can be a little bit of a challenge because of moisture migration and how does it eat and everything. And so um, it's not just as simple as you know dumping something in there or chopping something up from a um, a sheet of you know your product and um, and calling it good. So it's. Nothing's ever easy, but from the flavor profile, I think there is a lot of inspiration and a lot of opportunities to be drawn with concepts like that. And, uh, you know, it's always exciting and, and fun to play around with those, those ingredients. Yeah, absolutely. It is interesting though. Rachel and I use, uh, you know, like a Jenny's as a inspiration all the time for cheesecake even. So uh, to your point, uh, I think Kevin mentioned a place called Kelly's as well that's growing. And, uh, you know, I find ice cream is such a great uh, place to find flavor inspiration and as well as color um, and texture. Um, you know, I think there's obviously some folks that are really pushing uh, pushing the envelope. I think over Thanksgiving last year at Salt and Straw, they had like a turkey and cranberry ice cream. And, uh, you know, so there are some, some people that are doing some crazy stuff out there. And I think flavor like, perspective. what's interesting about what's happened in the market is that you look at places like Jenny's and, you know, sprinkles cupcakes, and then it was the popsicles, right. And now it's crumble cookies. And it's looking at, again, safe exploration within the dessert category. So like, I'm willing to go to crumble and, you know, their top seller is still probably their chocolate chip, but I might add on something uh, that's still in a cookie format. It might be sugar cookie with like a unique ingredient on top of it. Um, and I'd be willing to like stretch a bit and order that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, now, and the same thing with donuts, right? So those really sort of uber focused concepts that are allowing consumers to like have some fun with desserts in like a new way. So maybe it's, you know, 
it's brownies or cheesecake next, right? So should be fun to watch. So I've got a question for all of you, uh, really, and anybody else too in chat if you want to jump in. But it's like, are they? Is there an increase of number of desserts on menus? Period. I know you. I saw what you had, Rachel, in your you know your presentation there. But is that you know? Is it? Does everybody try to stick within that? Like, all right, we allow five. We have room on the menu for that, or whatever X is, right? And uh, do you find that to be kind of more the norm? I, I feel like I want to have my chefs answer that, and then I'll tell you what the data tells me. <laughs> it's not a trick. Yeah. How about wolves? You guys, what do you guys do? Uh, well, we do three. Um, I wish we did five. Um, I'm working on it, uh, but it's taking <laughs> some time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it depends on the brand, but I, I do think three could be a magic number and five could be a magic number too. Uh, and it depends on, on your core guest as well. Uh, but five seems to be a good one. Yeah. And I'll ask the one terrible thing to ask, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, Gluten free, going anywhere or not? <laughs> you gotta ask, right? It feels like it's sort of leveled off. Um, like, and I think historically, right? If you can offer something like an ice cream or a sorbet, like you automatically have a solution. So it's like, how much do you care about that? Like, veto vote type, uh, you know, dessert focused menu item. Um, I will say, you know. We we do have a gluten free cake uh, that I would cut next to our regular uh, cake every day, and I feel like it it has come a long way in the eating experience. Um, you know, it used to be something that was always super dry and really uh, you know not that desirable. Where now I think uh, you know we've refined the way of getting to that eating experience, and it's definitely less of a trade-off. So I think there's good solutions out there if you're willing to have something specific on the menu for it. So Andrea, um, I will say that I agree with you that I think it's it's leveled off from like the demand and part of that, I believe, so like even for me, it's like table stakes of something that I will at least ask and try to work towards. And because there are so many, you know, new solutions that will kind of get you there. Um, I think that's, that's also part of it, that it, it has definitely moved away from like a niche concern to being widespread. And what's interesting is, you know, there, there's a certain cohort of, of the public that is gluten sensitive and it doesn't even know it. Right. And, and so from, from my perspective, and there are certainly several people in, in my orbit that are either celiac or, or prefer to eat gluten-free, it, it's just, it's another nice to have, right? So it's another amenity and a layer that you can build in that I think delivers potentially intangible benefits when People know that there are multiple options and not just, you know, the token one. Um, so I do think it is it, it is worthy of exploring and making a priority. I mean, I would love to see, you know, I mean, it kind of going back to your menu count, right? Like how many um, desserts can you have, you know, on a menu? Um, you know, I think that it would be it would be great. I mean, like we I mean, like Andrew has said, like we have really delicious gluten-free um, options that um, can be cut against our regular cake. And there could be more exploration and opportunity there. We just don't get the dessert briefs for them from our, um, from our customers. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, maybe because it's like the, they're still trying to menu it as gluten-free. And so maybe won't get the buy-in at the, at the point of order. Um, but it's really interesting because, you know, we have the capabilities and the recipes and the ingredients and the supplier relationships to sort of make it even, even bigger. Um, but we're just not seeing it. You know, I can tell you like Andrew and I aren't, um, you know, looking at the pipeline of gluten-free desserts just because we're just not seeing that um, coming through. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not saying so much as, alternatives baked goods but you know for many 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 years like if you were making a mousse if you were making 
a pudding. You know, oftentimes there were ingredients that contained gluten in those things. It was kind of the hidden, the hidden gluten right. that that I feel like I'm I'm paying more attention to because it kind of goes back to like the the plant-based proteins, right? So do you want an analog? Do you want an approximation? And that's really difficult to justify to bring in a a second ingredient or a second finished product or, you know, something that impacts, you know, 10% of the population. So the, the cool thing is, is I think if you can emulate and you can make something that's just as good and performs just as well as a gluten-free product or sorry, a, a wheat product, then why wouldn't you potentially explore just an entire uh, line extension to say all, all of the, all of the, the decadence, all of the indulgence, and it's also gluten-free. So that's, that's one piece. Um, going back to your question about the number of desserts. So uh, obviously frozen custard is a significant portion of, of our business. I say significant, it's really only about uh, a, a buy-in of, of approximately like 20% of our guests um, will purchase a dessert. But what we know is that it over-indexes on purchase intent. So when we introduce a new flavor of the day, we see bumps across all menu categories simply because it drives traffic, right? So that's why we continue to place an emphasis and efforts around flavors of the day, even though, you know, they're single digits in terms of contributions to overall sales. So when I started, we had, we had almost a hundred flavors of the day, which as you can imagine, um, for my supply chain folks on the call, this is just a nightmare, right? And more importantly, many of them were very similar with just, you know, like one ingredient difference. And so we, we've really, really, really scaled back. We did a turf study analysis and that was the crazy part is we found that if we have 30, right? 30 different flavors, then we can reach 85% of our guests. So that was a little extreme for our franchisees. So we're landing somewhere between like 45 and 50 flavors. And, but as we add, we're also retiring flavors that, that are in that, you know, that bottom 10% um, quadrant. So the challenge is really because every restaurant sets its own flavor of the day calendar, it's managing those supply chains and ensuring that those ingredients are being utilized, that we're meeting our case minimums through our distribution centers. Um, it, it's actually a much more difficult process to manage and needle to thread than most people would think. Because if you think about it, we've got 50 and there are at most 31 days, but restaurants are going to want to over-index those top 10 flavors because they know that they drive sales. So introducing new flavors can be a challenge because our operators won't give them enough bandwidth to gain traction with the guests. That's really interesting, Quinn. I really, yeah, that's, that's a challenge. That's a numbers challenge and a half. So, well, great. Well, we are at the end of our time, unfortunately. This is great. Thanks so much to all of you for it. And thanks to everybody in attendance to uh, to listen. A uh, couple of key things to bring up is um, before we show our, our video at the end is, of course, we have events coming up here in the next couple of months. We start in uh, March typically and go through the end of October. So the season is beginning. Uh, first one is GCIA in Tampa at the end of March. Uh, we have Oaxaca, Mexico in, um, in uh, you know, of course, Mexico. Uh, that's going to be in April the 11th through the 15th. Um, Great attendance for both. We actually didn't have an opening in Oaxaca, but we have one now. Somebody had to cancel out last minute. So anybody that was wanting to come and wanted to uh, to get on, you can. Uh, and then, of course, NRA in May and the ICCA Summit in June, the 20th anniversary in San Antonio, which is going to be awesome. And then uh, GCIA's major event is going to be in October. Uh, that's in Nashville. So we have all that coming up. One other exciting thing is the ICCA website. 
Uh, we went live with it yesterday. So we want everybody to go on and give us some feedback. But I'm really excited about it because I think it's a lot easier to navigate now. We cut a lot of things out that nobody was really looking at. We were using a lot more video and a lot less verbiage. Uh, of course, some of the older things that we have on there are still similar to what we had done in the past. But we wanted to have those like big hits, if you will, of videos and events that we did and make them still available. Anybody that wants anything that we don't show on the website, like one of the events that you loved and it's not on there now because we didn't put everything back up to keep it cleaner, uh, we still have access to it and YouTube videos. So somebody can let us know and uh, and we can just you know direct you on how to get to that. Um, but anyway, thanks to everybody for being on here. We're going to have Mike show our closing video and uh, uh, we hope to see you next month on this and soon at our other events.